There is an expectancy in my heart today uh, for the message. I want you to begin to prepare your heart even as you're finding your Bible and as you're finding Romans chapter 8. There's an expectancy in my heart today. Last week, we launched a brand new series. We're calling it Overcoming the Orphan Spirit. And if you go up to the next slide, I want everybody to take a look at the two little things at the bottom of the screen. We're encouraging you to use social media. You lot of take notes on your phone. You take notes on your iPad and so on. At Family First is our tag, Family First, SH, Family First, Spring Hill. And if you post something, if I quote something, if there's a verse of scripture, if there's something that's meaningful to you, you want to tweet it, you want to post it on Facebook, use that little hashtag at the bottom right hand side, the little hashtag sign, Orphan Spirit. And that way anybody that goes on social media, they want to discover what's happening here at Family First. They want to hear what message we're talking about. That will point them to this collection of sayings and quotes and tweets and all that sort of thing. Today we're talking specifically about the spirit of adoption. Say that with me. The spirit of adoption. I want you to find Romans chapter 8 and I want to read verses 14, 15, 16, and 17 and then we're going to concentrate on verse 15 today. I want to speak as quickly as I can. The Holy Spirit has just downloaded into me this morning before all of you got here as I was praying and waiting on the Lord about some prophetic things, I think God has a word for some people today. How many want to hear a word from God today for your life? How many want to be receivers today of strength and wisdom? And the Bible says this in Romans chapter 8 verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of sons of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Verse 15, we concentrated on last week, is the theme of our entire series. And we'll be in this for a number of weeks. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. We understood that literally to be an orphan spirit. A separated, divided, removed, abandoned spirit. That causes you to be a slave again under fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption as sons. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The more I pray, the more I study, the more I seek the Lord for these services. God just continues to confirm to me how important this message is. Over Overcoming the orphan spirit. I believe this message is the message for the hour. It's the message for this generation. It's a message everyone needs to hear. It's the message for this culture. And it's applicable to everyone. Everyone in the body of Christ. And even everyone that is not yet in the body of Christ. Here's the first statement for you. This is an overcoming word. Everyone on the earth. How many of everyone's include you? Everybody say, I am an everyone. I am a son. Somebody. Everyone on the earth is influenced to one degree or another by the orphan spirit. And a few introductory truths. Being a Christian does not guarantee that you're not affected by the orphan spirit. Just because you're saved doesn't mean it won't try to influence you. I believe that you can overcome it. And in this series, we'll help you with that. But I cannot guarantee you won't be affected by it. Don't get the idea to turn off these messages. We'll just be because I'm a Christian. I've been saved pastor for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. I don't think this applies to me. No matter how many years you've been saved, you can even be in the ministry. And I'm going to tell you what, there are people in the ministry that deal with this every day of their lives. Coming from a great family with a good earthly father does not guarantee you won't be affected by the orphan spirit. Raised in, a, in an environment with a, a poor example of an earthly father can contribute to it. But you could be raised in a perfect family. You could have the best 
earthly father possible. And the circumstances, then the situations of life could still create inside of you a brokenness and an abandonment. One day, in a few weeks, I'll talk about the story of the prodigal son. You know what the word prodigal means? I'm not preaching up this morning, just an illustration. The word prodigal literally means wasteful. So we had a wasteful son. If we study that story, we actually realize we also had a wasteful father because he was willing to give away his unconditional love freely and unconditionally. But if we study the scripture, and this is what we'll learn in a two week, in a few weeks, this is actually the story of two orphan sons because both of them possess qualities that prove they were broken and they were abandoned, they were rejected and they were separated. So just being in a wonderful earthly family does not guarantee you won't deal with this. Being full of the Holy Spirit won't guarantee that you don't deal with an orphan spirit. Somebody said, well, pastor, bless God. I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't have any problems in my life whatsoever. We're good for you. (laughs) But why don't you come down off your religious high horse someday and realize that the rest of us live in the real world and we have a very real devil and he's out to rob, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But we can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and we can still deal with this thing. It's a huge thing. It's a huge need. It's a common need. And there's nothing to be embarrassed about. Sometimes we get convicted of the Holy Spirit and we resent it. Sometimes we get convicted of the Holy Spirit. We need to say, I don't resent that. I resemble that. (laughs) So don't resent the conviction of the Holy Spirit today. Resemble the Holy Spirit today and realize that he's speaking to your life. I was going to give you this last week. And I didn't, so let I uh, save it for today as an illustration of this orphan spirit. And we're going to move on to the solution today. One year, Hallmark Cards said we're going to do a brand new endeavor that we've never done before. They collected a lot of their Mother's Day cards. And they went into institutions. They went into prisons. They went into correctional facilities. And they made the announcement, we will give free Mother's Day cards to all of the inmates that want to send them out to their mothers. It was a huge, huge response. Every individual, every man, every woman, every adolescent, they they collected Mother's Day cards because they wanted to send them to their mothers on Mother's Day that Hallmark provided free of charge. It was such a wonderful endeavor. A month rolled around. They said, let's do this again. They made the announcement, we will give free Father's Day cards to every person that's incarcerated in this facility if you want to send the Father's Day card to your father. And to their surprise, the requests were very, very minimal. It illustrates the fact they were, you know, it's like which came first, the chicken or the egg? They're either in the institution because they did not have a father or because they did not have a father, they were led down a path and it got them into trouble. The influence of the broken, the separated, the abandoned spirit is absolutely huge in our society today. Now, let me define it for you. We worked on this last week, but let me give you this definition so you'll know what we're talking about. An influence of demonic origin which causes people to feel rejected, separated, and abandoned, particularly from any fatherly figure or influence in their life. It's a spirit. How many know that a spirit is an influence? I'm not talking about demonic possession. I'm not saying that people in the church today or people in the society today need to have some exorcism exercised over them. You know, that's an extreme thing. But what I am saying is there is an influence. There's a spirit of the culture. There's a spirit of the society that causes people because of hurts or pains or wounds and everybody in the body of Christ has received father pain at one time in their life. Dr. David Nichols, if you remember him, often talks about father pain. I don't care how good of an earthly father you were raised by, you still have memories of father pain in your life and you need to take that to the cross lest the enemy use that as an influence to produce inside of you this spirit of separation, this spirit of brokenness, the spirit of abandonment. So we talked a lot last time about the orphan spirit. And I'm not going to linger, but do you remember the little game we played? Just for a few minutes, you might be an orphan if. You remember that? 
Remember that little thing that they do on the late night uh, television shows? You might be a redneck if. I'm not, not going to redo that today. But you might be an orphan if you always feel self-conscious and that no one ever really likes you. You might feel like everyone is always out to get you. Unable to develop re deep roots in a church or other places to establish meaningful relationships. You might be an orphan if you find yourself running from place to place, person to person, job to job, church to church, relationship to relationship. And the pattern just continues to replicate itself. I'll never forget, I've got to hurry to the message this morning, but I'm trying to lay the foundation. I'll never forget, this has been a number of years ago. It's been at least 10 years ago, maybe closer to 12 or 15 years ago. We used to have what we called the guest reception room here at Family First. It was back where the cafe is now, but it was a room and it wasn't all opened. And we would make announcement that any of the guests, any of the first timers, if they would come to the guest reception room after the service, they would meet my wife Crystal and I and some of our leaders and we would talk to them and we'd have a few brief snacks. And I'd always go back to the guest reception room and, and greet people and shake their hand and thank them for coming. And I'll never forget, I don't remember the individual's name. I don't remember what they look like, but I'll never forget the words that came out of their mouth. We're standing there talking and I was welcoming this person and telling how glad I am that they came to church today and so on. And the individual said things like this. Well, Pastor Coates... I just want you to know that it seems like I get hurt in every church I've ever attended. I said, oh, really? They said, yes, it seems like every church I go to, every church I've ever been in my whole life, the pastors always end up doing something that offends me and I always get my feelings hurt and I, I've just never been able to find where I really fit. And I'm not going to go down that road. Come on, receive this with some strength and wisdom. If someone comes into the house telling me how great I am and how great the pastor was or how terrible the pastor was at the house where they used to be, it'll only be six months and they'll, they'll be telling the next pastor at the next next house how great he is and how terrible I am. Come on somebody, I'm preaching pretty good this morning. Do you resemble this <laughs> or do you resent this? And I looked at that individual that day in the guest reception room and it was an innocent question. I said, well, how many churches have you been in? Here was the answer. Fourteen. Fourteen. And I knew as well as I'm standing here today that that individual was probably looking into the face of number 15 because it wasn't going to be very long at all till that same spirit that had caused them to never feel that they were included, to never be able to put down roots, to never be able to grow in the ebb and the flow of the good and the bad. And I knew that no matter what I said, no matter what I did, unless that orphan spirit was somehow taken off of them, number 14 was soon going to become number 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 and 20. Do you know what I'm talking about? It would just continue and continue. So I want you to know today that there is very much a real orphan spirit in the world. It's abandonment, it's separation, it's rejection, it's what so many people are dealing with. But here's the cure. We're going to concentrate on the cure today. The cure for the orphan spirit is the spirit of adoption. I want you to look at Romans 8.15. Now, we're ready for some Bible study. How many are ready for some meat today? Are you ready to learn? You're ready to grow up? You're ready to, to dig in? All right, look at this. For you did not receive the orphan spirit, the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. The Apostle Paul is doing a comparative analysis here. Do you know what that means? He's comparing and contrasting. He's saying, you've not received an orphan spirit, but on the contrary, what you have received is another spirit. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So in this comparative analysis, he's saying there's two totally different spirits. Now let me say again, a spirit is an influence. We're not talking about 
something austere. We're not talking about something just, you know, very dramatic, great, very great thing that has to be exercised. We're, we're talking about an influence. Two totally different influences from two totally different sources. There is, first of all, in the world today, an orphan spirit. Now, you notice in the scripture, it's a small S. It's a small spirit. Small S in the word. It's not a divine spirit. It's not a godly spirit, but it's evil origin. It's demonic intent. It is an influence. It is an orphan separation spirit. But in contrast to that, that is not of God, that leads to separation and division and abandonment and brokenness, there is another spirit at work. And it is a capital letter S, meaning it is a divine origin, meaning literally it is of the Holy Spirit. It is good. It is godly. It is of Holy Spirit origin. And for those of you that would really want to learn something, this is in the Greek text, the word pneuma homates. The word pneuma is actually the word air. You know what? Something is pneumatic. It has air in it. Pneumatic tires or tires that you have to pump up with pressure in your car because they're filled with air. Pneuma is the word air. And in John 20, Jesus used it to talk about the Holy Spirit. And we sang about it this morning. He is the bread that we breathe. His oxygen is now in my lungs because Jesus in the upper room looked at his disciples in John 20, 20 and he said, Receive ye. And Jesus blew on them. Receive ye the whole... Somebody just said, Pastor, I just woke up. Can I use that microphone next Sunday morning? No, this is my microphone. And you can't blow on my microphone. Only I can blow on my microphone. And then we disinfect it in the name of Jesus. But, you know, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the holy breath. So breath is pneuma. And this is the pneuma homotes. The spirit or the breath of adoption. Now get this. There's an influence. There's a spirit that leads to separation, division, abandonment, and brokenness. But there is also a breath of God that is a capital letter S that is of the Holy Spirit and it is a wind blowing in the earth today that does not lead to brokenness and separation and division. It leads to healing and it's an adoptive spirit. It's the spirit of sonship whereby we come in a relationship with God and we call Him Abba Father because we were once separated, divided and broken but now His Spirit is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and we'll come on somebody get a hold of this we that were once far away are now brought near and he has breathed on us the spirit that's made us alive so the spirit of adoption the capital letter S is actually the Holy Spirit how many know there's only one Holy Spirit I don't care what you call him he's still the same guy third member of the Godhead Trinity He's not wind, but he refreshes like wind. He's not fire, but he purifies like fire. He's not a dove sitting on my shoulder. He is gentle as a dove, but he's not a bird cooing in the air. He is a person, and his influence in my life is to be an adoptive influence. Not a rejecting influence, but a welcoming influence. Not an abandoning influence, but an embracing influence. And so we are not being led today by the... The spirit of an orphan rejection spirit, but we are being welcomed by the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So the solution, get this quick word, the solution for the orphan spirit is to experience the spirit of adoption and to become a chosen son or daughter of God. Now I want to give you this morning, quickly, a little exposition. Here's Romans chapter 8, verses 14, 15, 16, 17, in an exposition. What that means, we're going to break these verses down. I'm going to give you a one, two, three, a skeleton to hang this, like a Bible study here. So here's number one. Get a hold of this. Verse 14. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, that's the Spirit of adoption. The Spirit leads us to become adopted as the sons of God. If you're adopted as a son of God today, how did that happen? How did it take place? Well, it started by the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, He's the same one. And He led you to be adopted as the Son of God. Romans 8 verse 14. For all who are led 
by the Spirit of God or the sons of God. If you're a son of God today, the Holy Spirit was involved in that leading process. Jesus said, John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So it is the Holy Spirit that leads you into a relationship. The orphan spirit will lead you away from God. It will lead you away from authority. It will lead you away from people that love you and care for you. It will cause you to fulfill a self-fulfilling prophecy. You feel abandoned so you think that is your cult, your destiny and you live an abandoned, separated life. But the spirit of adoption leads us back toward the Father in the right relationship with the God and we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, two or three things. Look at this. Look at this verse. No one... We'll go back to uh, verse 14 on the previous screen. For all who are led... Previous, or not previous, but continuous action verb in the Greek tense... In other words, you are being led by the Spirit of God. It's not a one-time thing. It's not just it happened once and that was the end of it. But it's a present, continuous action verb. Not a completed process, but a process that is still taking you somewhere. All that are the sons of God are... How many of you are being led? Not that you were led or you might be led, but you are being led by the Spirit of God. Where is He taking you? He's taking you into sonship. He's taking you into adoption. And there's several words. I'll just mention them quickly. The first step of this process is what we call conviction. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin is not a mean spirit. It's an adoptive spirit. Because before we can embrace a right relationship with the Father, we have to realize that we're sinful and we confess and forsake our sin. So the first thing that the Holy Spirit does to lead persons into the spirit of adoption is to convict them of their sin. But after the conviction, there comes illumination. Illumination is the revelation of the truth of the Word of God. That's when you begin to read the Bible and it makes sense. That's where you attend a service and all of a sudden the words that the pastor is speaking, they connect with you and your thinking and you begin to realize, I think God loves me. I think God's got a plan for my life. There is illumination. There is revelation on the Word of God that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins. Then that leads to regeneration. This is the actual experience. Now this is all the leading of the Holy Spirit. Are you getting this? Because all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And the Spirit of adoption regenerates us into right relationship with God. No one who's truly saved could ever be saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that there's a lot of people, i got to be careful when I get these revelations and things come to me. There's a lot of churches in America that don't embrace the Holy Spirit like we do. They don't welcome Him in the sense that we do. They don't flow in His gifts and His callings and in anointings quite like we do. But I've got news for them. If they're seeing people get saved, they're doing it by the Holy Spirit. They may not have the Holy Spirit name over their doorpost. They may not walk under that mantle. They may not want to be referred to as a Holy Ghost church. But if they're getting people saved, the Holy Spirit's in that place. Because no one can come to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit who sent Him draws them. And even they, they may not understand it, they haven't come into the full revelation of the explanation of who the Holy Spirit and His fullness and His power, it is only... Only the Holy Spirit that can regenerate a person and make them cross over from death unto life, from sin into salvation. Ephesians 2.5 Even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. So there's conviction, there's illumination, there's regeneration, and then there's the ongoing work of purification that we call sanctification. Now get this, Romans 8.11. I can't linger on this, this would be an Easter service, but Romans 8.11 says, If the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in ye, who who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit that lives in you. Now somebody say, well that just applies to Easter. 
Jesus was in the grave and the Holy Spirit came into the lifeless, listless, literally bloodless body of Jesus and made him alive and resurrected him from the dead. That's right. Praise God. But that verse has a whole lot more than just the promise of Jesus' resurrection. That verse has the promise of my sanctification. If the same Holy Spirit, how many Holy Spirits are there? There's only one. If the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ out of the grave is living inside of me, then the dead, lifeless, listless, literally bloodless body of Jesus that was in the tomb is a representation of my body that is dead in transgressions and sins, cannot live for God, cannot make right decisions, cannot say no to sin, but the Spirit of God lives inside of me and so I've got an anointing that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world that I can walk on water even if I can't stop down the steps and God can enable me by his quickening to overcome. So when the enemy says you got to do this, I say I got news for you. I ain't got to do nothing that you say because I've got the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living inside of me. I got to smoke. No, I don't because I'm free in the name of Jesus. I got to drink. No, I don't because I've got self-control by the Holy Ghost. I've got to watch pornography. No, I don't because I believe like I can be delivered by the power of God that is able to quicken my mortal body by the Spirit of Jesus that's living inside of me. And that's where I'm moving. Because I'm not a slave to fear anymore. I am a son of God. Are you with me? So that's only the first 14. Now that's the Holy Spirit leading to the adoption. Now number two, the Spirit enables. Everybody say enables. The Spirit enables us to become adopted as sons. And I'll read that verse again, but there it is, 815. Now list this. The term adoption is filled with love, it's filled with grace, it's filled with compassion, it's filled with intimate relationship. What a beautiful word, the word adoption. I bless Omar and Mandy for stepping up and adopting children into their home. And that was finalized this past week. I commend the orders for stepping up in the spirit of adoption and welcoming abandoned children into their home. And the love, the compassion, the grace, that word adoption, oh, what an awesome, awesome word. There may be others in the house. I don't mean to overlook you, but I commend you. In the Roman culture of Paul's day, an adopted child was always equal and in some cases was granted additional prestige and privilege over natural born children. The father always had absolute rule over the children. Now get this, strong. If a father was ever disappointed in the skills, in the character, in the demeanor, in a natural born son, he could search for a son to adopt. One that would demonstrate the Character, the skills, the wisdom that he desired. And at the father's death, the adopted son would often receive the father's title, the majority part of the father's estate, and he would become the primary progenitor of the family name. Because it was not a second class status. It was not a secondary thing. It was not anything less than a chosen relationship with all of the rights and privileges and even some additional prestige and privileges heaped on the top of it. Because it was the will of the Father. Now there were three steps in the Roman custom of adoption. Number one i got three words for you, separation, association, and celebration. Let me explain those. The first step is separation. The first step was to totally sever that boy's legal and social relations to his natural, his former family. In other words, the father said he's going to separate him from the past. Legally, all debts 
are canceled. No one could ever come back and ask for payment for an adopted son. Because when he was adopted, all bets were off. He was separated legally. All liabilities were removed. No one could ever come back later and hold him liable for any action or decision that were made under his previous family uh, lifestyle and, and relationship. All ties were broken. Socially, any previous social status was revoked. Any limitations were removed. Anyone that would associate him now with his previous family would be corrected. No, he's no longer associated with that line. He's now associated with the new father because separation, all previous alliances and relationships were revoked. Secondly, and I use the word association, he was then placed permanently associated into his new family. Not only were all the debts removed, old liabilities canceled, old affiliations broken, but now everything was made as if it never even existed. And he was legally confirmed to be forever a part of that new family. In fact, the Roman law required this adoption to be done in the presence of seven witnesses. Now the other day, this beautiful family went to the courthouse. And in Hernando County, the judge testified, he verified, he authenticated the adoption. In the Roman culture, seven witnesses. They would all be there. They would hear the will of the Father. They would validate seven witnesses because in the culture, the documentation was not like it is today. It was not recorded, physically written down somewhere in a courthouse, but there would be seven witnesses. And if anyone would ever question it, he had seven people that he could refer to to back up that this was indeed the will of the Father. This adoption really was transacted, and this son was now an adopted son of the family. So there was separation, there was association, and and then there was celebration. There would be a formal time of presentation to the world of the fact that this was now an adopted son of the father. Everyone in the countryside, far and wide, would celebrate the fact that the father had a brand new son. And the son had a brand new father. Oh, I, I got to get a hold of this. Is anybody ready for a shout break this morning? Come on, somebody. Before I came to Jesus, before I became a child of Almighty God, I was a child of another family. Physically, I was known as the biological son of Rick, but spiritually, I was a son. I'm not saying this demeaning to me. It's the same for you, whether you want to admit it or not. If you're a Christian today, that's wonderful. But before you were saved, you were of your, your father, the devil. You were under Satan's dominion and rule. By default, he was our spiritual father. The sin of Adam and Eve transputed on down to us, and we were under the control of Satan, the spiritual father of our sin. Jesus said this to help you understand it. He said one day to the Pharisees, now they tried to tell him that they were children of God because they were physical sons of Abraham. The Pharisees said, well, Jesus, we're physical sons of Abraham. And since we're the physical sons of Abraham, that automatically makes us spiritual sons of God. And Jesus, no, no, you don't understand it. You might have been physical sons of Abraham, but that does not guarantee that you're spiritual sons of God. In fact, Jesus said to them, John 8, 44, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. He is a liar and the father of lies. And they were of their father the devil. I was of my father the wicked one. But when I got adopted, guess what? The Holy Spirit of God canceled any authority that my spirit spiritual father of darkness had over me and I'm able to declare to you today the greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world and not only is Satan's power come on not only is Satan's power over me broken but now he's under my feet behold Jesus said I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers that were against you because once I was under the command of an unjust father but that debt was canceled that wiped slate clean and now I'm chosen to be an adopted son of the most high God how many are glad your, your debts are canceled can I see your hand how many are thankful your liabilities are taking place <laughs> 
How many are glad that you can declare in the name of Jesus that even though you sowed some wild oats, <laughs> you're not going to be liable for the mistakes that you've made in your past? i got news for you. My past is under the covering of the forgiveness of God. Malachi the prophet, or Micah rather, says it's as far removed as us from the east is from the west. It's under the ocean floor. That's where my sins are. Never to be remembered against me again because it was separated from me. Oh, it's an old song. <laughs> I think a few of you might relate to it. It's an old song from the 70s. It was performed by that theological mastermind, Bob Dylan. <laughs> and this is what he said. I was blinded by the devil, born already ruined, stone cold deadhead as I stepped out of the womb. But by his grace, I have been touched. By his word, I have been healed. By his hand, I've been delivered. By his spirit, I've been saved. Because I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. And the devil ain't got no hold on me anymore because I was canceled from my debt. I was forgiven of my sin. My slate was wiped clean and I'm separated from my past so I can be released into my future. Oh, come on. I figured you'd shout today. Praise the Lord. But not only was I separated from my past, <laughs> I was placed eternally into my new family as a son of God. Ephesians 2, 9. Strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. How many witnesses did it take to testify to Roman adoption? Just testing your memory. I know it's been five minutes ago. Seven. God's number of completion. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is called in the Word of God the sevenfold Spirit of God? In fact, in Isaiah chapter 11, it says there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. Now here he is, the spirit of the Lord. One shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, and of might, and of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. The sevenfold witnesses of the Holy Spirit. Oh, come on somebody, get ready for your shout break. Take a dip, big deep breath so you're going to get ready. Revelation chapter 1. One verse 4, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you from him who was and who is and he who is to come and from the seven spirits, that's the Holy Spirit that is before the throne of God. According to Revelation 1, according to Isaiah 11, there are seven spirits that testify to the fact that I have been adopted as a child of the Most High God. The Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. They all stand ready. If anybody's listening to their opinion, if anybody wants to make accusation, I'm not going to answer the door. I'm not going to respond to my accusers. I'm just going to respond by sending my Holy Spirit to the door. And the Spirit of the witness of the Father testifies that I've crossed from death unto life. His Spirit bears witness with my Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of adoption. I know you can get a hold of this. Can you handle it a little bit more? One of these days, one of these days, turn to your neighbor and say, one of these days, one of these days, there's going to be a party. There's going to be a formal presentation to the world that the Father is going to put you and I, the entire body of Christ, out on display. And he's going to say, I want everybody to know these are my sons. These are my children. These are my daughters. And the Bible says this. Now you know that whenever a father gets a new son, there's plenty of parties going on. There's plenty of celebrating. There's, you remember the story of the prodigal son. When the son came home, the father said, we're going to have a party. Oh, I can't wait for a few weeks to preach that whole story to you in the context of the orphan spirit. It's going to be full of revelation. But one of these days, my father is going to throw a party. And you know what? It's going to be a good party. Because he's been making preparations now for over 2,000 years. A few months ago, my wife and I, our family, made presentation of the fact that we're getting a new son.
I wasn't losing a daughter. I got a new son on November the 8th, 2015. And so we, pre- did I get that right? November the 8th. And so we prepared for that. We paid money for that. We put up a big tent. We welcomed people. We bought food. We did all kinds of things because it was a big deal to make a celebration of the fact that we've got a new member of the family. And you know what? God has been making preparation for almost 2,000 years. He's been cooking that leg of lamb stew. I know for some of you Puerto Ricans, it's probably going to be like roast pork, like white, like, uh, white rice and yellow beans. You know, it's going to be something amazing. And when God throws a party, He says, Whosoever will may come and celebrate with me the party that I'm going to throw for my sons. And here's what it says. Oh, you got to get a hold of this. You say, Pastor, you're just making a lot of noise. No, I'm teaching you more Bible than what you have a heart to receive. But here's Romans 8, 19. For the creation waits... With eager expectation. I'm reading King James here from my memory. For the manifestation of the sons of God to be revealed. You know what that means? All of creation is waiting. Literally, the creation is standing on its tiptoes. The word is as in a lady in childbirth. Anticipating birth pains are coming. All of creation groaneth in travail. For that day of the manifestation of the sons of God. Meaning that the whole earth and every creation is waiting till the day when God rolls back the sky like a scroll. And he says, here, I'm going to put on display my children. These are now my sons and daughters. And that's going to happen at the coming of Jesus when he returns and we come back with him riding on a white horse. Because by the spirit of adoption, we were separated from the past. We were associated with the future. And we were celebrated with the blessing of God for what God has done in our lives. I want to give you something today that this really uh, comes down to. Meredith, if you'd like to come on up, please. There are two primary things you receive from your father. Now, push past through any prejudice. Push past through any broken memories. Push past through any pain. Push past through any trauma you ever remember. And I mentioned the word father. Some people just cringe. Push past all of that right now. There are two things that you can receive from your father. I'm talking about the good, good father. I'm talking about the father in heaven. Two things that you can receive by this spirit of adoption. You receive your identity and you receive your inheritance. I thought I'd talk about both of those today, but I I really think we'll save the second one. We'll save inheritance for another day. But I want to talk about identity. When you receive the spirit of adoption and you cry, Abba, Father, what you get is an identity that you never had before. It's a name change. It is an association. It is a relationship. Now listen to this. You get your name from your father. Listen to this. You get your identity from your father. I'm a Coates today because my daddy was a Coates. And his daddy before him was a Coates. I'm not a Morris. There's Morris blood in me. There's Atterbury blood in me. Crystal is from the Seward family. There's Seward blood in her. There's Bost blood in her. All of these different families contributed to our existence. But I'm not a Morris today. I'm not an Atterbury today. I'm not a Tucker today. Think of some other names in my family. I am a Coates today. Because I was given my identity by my father. Now, I don't know if I need to linger. And if you'll receive this, just a word and you'll get the understanding. Most people today in our culture have no idea who they are. They have no identity whatsoever. They're blind leaders of the blind. They're lost. They're abandoned. They're just wanderers. They don't know who they are spiritually. They don't know who they are mentally. They don't know who they are socially. Get this, it's another message for another time, but it's so appropriate, and I'm not going to pass over it. 
they don't even know who they are sexually they're confused that they're they're just separated and i want you to get a hold of this most brokenness in this area in our culture today this is my opinion if you believe something else then you preach what you believe on your microphone this is my microphone that god has given me to declare what i believe according to the word of god that most of the confusion most of the immorality most of the stuff comes out of a broken abandoned pain filled trauma filled experience in life that caused an orphaned rejected abandoned spirit to get released inside of them because you get your name you get your identity from your father So if you don't know who your father is, you won't know who you are. What does the culture say? The culture has the slang say this. Well, who's your daddy? Well, I know who my daddy is. I know who my earthly daddy is. And I'm so thankful for the godly heritage that he leaves me. But I also know who my spiritual father in heaven is. And I know today that my identity, who I am, is not going to be stamped on me from my culture. It's not going to be stamped on me from my pain. It's not going to be stamped on me from trauma or disappointment or rejection or failure or disaster that I have went through because I'm not going to be labeled by my circumstances. Have I ever failed? I failed, but I'm not a failure today because I'm not named by my failures. Have I ever made mistakes? I've made many mistakes, but I'm not labeled by my mistakes today because my mistakes don't label me. My father labeled me. I'm not broken today. Have I ever felt broken? Have I ever been broken? Absolutely. But I've not embraced that broken self-portrait. I've embraced a whole self-portrait that my father in heaven has spoken of. Oh, is anybody getting a hold of this? You say, Pastor, what's all that mean? Let me, let me put it for you in a biblical context. Don't be labeled by your failures. Don't be labeled by your pain. Don't be labeled by your mistakes. Don't be labeled by your bitternesses. Accept the label that your Father in heaven would put on you. In Genesis chapter 35, Genesis chapter 35, look this up some other time, read the scriptures, check it out. Jacob loved Rachel earnestly how many know that this is the story where he worked for her for 14 years he worked for seven years to receive rachel his bride and of course laban tricked him because jacob which means the thief crooked as a barrel of snakes always manipulating he found out there was a bigger crook than he was and laban of course gave him rachel when or uh, leah when he was laboring for rachel So he worked for another seven years, 14 years, for Rachel, and he loved her dearly. Jacob had 11 sons. I'm not recommending this. (laughs) I'm not embracing this. I'm just telling you this is what the Bible history says. He had six sons from Leah. He had two sons from Bilna, which is Rachel's servant. He had two sons from Zilpah, which is Leah's servant. And he had one son from Rachel, whose name was Joseph, his favorite, of which he made the coat of many colors. But the prophecy was that there would be how many sons of Jacob? Twelve. His name would no longer be Jacob. His name would become Israel. And there would be twelve sons that would make up the twelve tribes. Of the nation of Israel and your Bible says in Genesis chapter 35 that Rachel is getting older and she becomes pregnant and in an especially difficult delivery literally what the Bible is going to tell us here is that Rachel died in childbirth in fact Genesis 35 verses 17 and the first part of verse 18 says this look closely And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she literally died in childbirth, giving birth to Jacob's twelfth son. As she was dying, she called forth his name, 
shall be called Ben Oni. Ben Oni. Do you know what that means? It means son of my pain. Son of my trauma. Son of the very thing that brought death into my life. And I want to tell you what. There's a lot of people today that allow their circumstances, their pain, the trauma, their disaster that comes in forth into their life to name all the progeny that they bring into the world. This is the son of my pain. I'm going to label myself Ben me, son of my pain, because I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I've been rejected, I've been abandoned. I'm going to go through my whole life and I'm going to put the label right on my forehead, the big L, loser, failure, person that's never going to amount to anything, abandoned and broken and separated. But your Bible says this, Jacob stepped up and look at verse number 18, the rest of it. As her soul was departing and she was dying, she called his name ben son of my pain. But Jacob, where do you get your identity? Do you get your identity from your pain, from your sorrow, from your rejection, from your pain, from your failure? No, you get your identity from your father. And Jacob stepped up and he said this, no son of mine is going to be labeled the rest of his life son of his mother's pain. He's not going to go through, through the rest of his life. And everybody look at him and say, what's your name? My name is ben because I literally caused the death of my mother. My mother died in childbearing. Can you imagine the stigma? Can you imagine the trauma? Can you imagine the pain that would follow that young man all the rest of his life? But his father Jacob said, you're not going to bear that label, son. No one's going to put that trauma upon you. You're not going to live in that reality. But your name is going to be Benjamin. Not Ben on me, son of my pain. But Benjamin, son of my right hand or son of my strength. Because through your darkest hour, God is going to produce strength and anointing and victory in you. Oh, come on, stand to your feet this morning. Give the Lord a great big shout of praise because the Father wants to put a label on you. And the label that your Father wants to give you is the label that will create your identity that you live into. Stop letting the world define you and start declaring that your definition, your destiny comes from the plan of God for your life. There's people in this house. I prayed this morning before I got here for the spirit of the prophetic to flow. If it flows today, don't be embarrassed and don't blame me. Just blame the Holy Spirit because sometimes God gossips. Sometimes God tells people secrets that we don't think anybody else knows. And I've got news for you today. There's some people in this room. You've named yourself because of your pain. You've named yourself because of your trauma. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is a wonderful thing. That's why we don't need to run from it. We need to run to it. It's not a bad thing. It comes in the love of the Father. And we put labels on ourselves. Son of my pain. Son of my failure. Son of my trauma. This is the destiny that I'm going to live into. Your Father in heaven says, Karen, you're not labeled for the rest of your life by the fact that you went through the tragic pain of the loss of your husband. You will not carry that stigma any longer. But God would say to you, you're not a daughter of adversity. You're not a daughter of pain and suffering and sorrow and remorse. But you're a daughter of the Father. And He puts a new label on you. He puts a new future in you. And He put a new man of God beside you that would cover you and protect you and be everything that God wants you to be because your future is not in your past. Your future is in the promises of God and your pain is beyond you and your future is in front of you Omar I commend you because I know you've said you've come from a tough past but no father and you know so many guys like you would in that trauma pass that on to their own children not willingly not wantingly but psychologically and, and spiritually the pain that you felt as a child could often be transputed to your children. And I speak a blessing over you, my friend. And I don't mean to embarrass you, but I almost like say like you're a son to me. You're like too old to be my son. Like you're, you're like way up there in years now and I'm only 35. But, and I commend you because you've not embraced the pain. You've not labeled yourself from the past. 
And you've put your anointing and your blessing on your sons and your daughters. Sons and daughters. You've got more than one daughter now. And you've got three sons for the glory of God. And I just speak anointing over you, my friend. I speak the blessing of the Father that would open the windows of heaven and pour forth for you so much blessing and so much anointing that there's no room to contain it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I could walk around. I could talk to every one of you. I won't. But I could. Because this is what it's like to have a pastor. Not a preacher. Not someone that just gives biblical lessons. But a pastor. A pastor that knows your life. He knows your ups. He knows your downs. He knows your pain. He knows your trauma. And he's there to speak into you the future of the covering of the blessing of the past. I just bless Pastor Cannon here this morning. That when he, through the work of the ministry, went through some hard times. Ever go through some hard times in the ministry, Pastor? Ever have some people in the church not follow the, the leading of the Holy Spirit and make bonehead decisions? Yeah. People sometimes make poor choices. But you didn't allow that to define your future. You said the trauma of my past is not going to preclude the destiny of my future. I'm not going to wear a label for the rest of my life. Ben on me. I'm going to put a label on myself. Benjamin, son of my strength. Susan, don't label yourself from anything in your past. Don't allow anybody else to label things from your past and if people put those labels on you you don't need those people in your life you need people that will put God's word and God's future and God's blessing on your life and don't embrace your pain embrace your future and operate and move into that in the name of Jesus everybody's going to look down at the ground if I make eye contact with pastor he's going to start talking about me if the Holy Spirit wants me to but that's not necessary because he knows you and he talks to you. Lift your hand real high, everybody in the house. Father God, today, you know how this word burns inside of me. And Lord, you know how that so many in our world today they're living such tragic, disappointed lives because they've allowed the pain, the trauma, the injury, the bitterness of the past to define them. And I declare even over myself that any dishonor I've ever received in the ministry, every dishonor I've ever received as a man of God is not going to define my future. It's not going to define what God is going to do me because the reproach of the past is rolled away and the blessing of the future is as bright as the promises of God. And I speak over everyone in this house today that they are not defined by a label that the enemy or the world would try to put on them. They're only defined by the label that the Father in heaven has put upon them. And they are sons, they are daughters, they are children of the Most High God. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed this morning. Two things are on my heart right now, and then we're going to close. Number one is if there's anyone in the room that's never given your heart to Jesus. You've never experienced this adoption, never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I forgive and forget. I, I want to be under the blood. I want you to have mercy on my life. If you've never been saved, experienced this miracle of adoption, the spirit of adoption today wants to draw you to Jesus. Is there anyone? Just, just step out and come right now if that's you. Just step out of your chair, wherever you're standing. Just, just walk down this aisle. We've got friends in this church that will pray for you. We will encourage you. We'll give you literature. We'll follow up with you because your future is in front of you and your past is behind you. And God wants to call you His child. All right. It's still open. The altar's available if anyone wants to come in the next few minutes or so. But how many will say, Pastor, 
I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm saved. I'm a son or a daughter of God. But I see areas in my life where I struggle with this. I question things so often. I, I just feel so often like I'm labeled by my failures or my, my pain, my trauma is limiting the future. It seems like if, if I don't watch it, the, the things automatically like project into my future, they become self-fulfilling prophecies. But I want to declare today by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that my future is defined by the Father who gave me His new name. And I'm Benjamin, son of the strength, not son of pain. I would love to lay hands on anyone I can this morning. If you want to come, Meredith is going to play some music. She'll lead us in some worship. There'll not be a formal dismissal this morning. And if you say, Pastor, you just don't have anything better to do than stand around the altars and pray for people. i got a wife to celebrate with today that we celebrated 35 years of marriage today. But right now, my assignment is to you. And I want to lay my hands on you and speak over you the future that God has for you. If you want prayer, if you deal with an orphan spirit, now, as I said in the beginning, you know, sometimes, oh, that's not me. I'm saved. I don't have that evil thing. Come on, man. Be real. I deal with it all the time. And if you don't, then you're living a fantasy world. But come for prayer. Come for encouragement and instruction from the Word of God.